Morning everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jane Hussey. Um, I'm going to be spending the next 30 to 40 minutes talking to you about the Modern Slavery Act um, and talking also a little bit more widely around ethics and reputational issues, particularly in the context of your role as um, in-house lawyers. Um, my specialism is supply chain contracting, so it's through that lens that I will be primarily focusing. Um, before we kick off, um, I'll, I'll just deal with a couple of housekeeping points. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? Um, as I've just mentioned, a recording, uh, we're making a recording of this session, so that will be available afterwards and we will be circulating that to you all. And it will also be available on our in-house in focus hub, which you'll find on, on the Mills and Reef website. Um, do feel free to ask questions i will deal with those at the end and you'll see as you navigate along the bottom of your screen there's a q a function um so, so type your your questions in there equally if um any of you if, if i raise anything that anybody would like to pick up with me separately then do feel free to get in touch after this session and finally um as i always say your feedback's really really valuable to us um, to allow us to refine this program and also to ensure that we cover topics that are of interest to you. So again, at the end of this session, we'll be asking for feedback and please do give um, full feedback and suggest topics um, for future sessions. What I would like to cover uh, in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is I'm going to give you a sort of reminder of the Modern Slavery Act 2015. Um, so I will be covering um, the, the key principles of the Act in the context of the supply chain transparency requirements um, and also be talking to you about why it is relevant to all of your organisations. I'm also going to touch on some coronavirus guidance um, that the government issued in April related to the Act. I'll then move on to some wider ethical issues and in particular look at the um, human rights impact assessments and then we will round up by um i'll, I'll just say a few words about the role of the in-house legal function in preserving and enhancing a business's reputation before we kick off we'd like to run a very quick poll if you don't mind um so okay can you put the poll question up please um if you could just answer this question um my team has an important role to play in preserving and promoting my organization's reputation and grade that from strongly disagree through to five strongly agree. Um, what we will do is we will run this poll again at the end and just uh, as a matter of interest to us all see if people's views have, have changed. Um, it, it, it is quite nice looking at it that I, uh, potentially preaching to the converted as it were, because I can see um, that, that, that we've got quite a lot of agrees and strongly agrees in there. Okay, so um, let's move on then. Um, I will, um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Kate. So the background to the Modern Slavery Act is that it was something that was sort of conceived of and heavily promoted by Theresa May when she was Home Secretary. Um, and at that point, there was a, a great deal of political will for this piece of legislation to be groundbreaking. Some of you may be aware that um, California has similar legislation, but our uh, Modern Slavery Act goes much further, and particularly around the transparency and supply chains requirements. Um, Karen Bradley, who was the minister in charge of abuse and exploitation at the time the act was introdu introduced, um, spoke of the objective behind the act and what she said was the modern slavery act will be the first of its kind in the world and the, the transparency and supply chain measure goes further than any other legislation how businesses respond to it will be crucial i want to challenge them to look for the most innovative the most exciting the most far-reaching and forward-thinking solutions to the problem of modern slavery in supply chains um, in the context of relevance, in all honesty, it is relevant to all organisations 
because all organizations have supply chains. Of course, those supply chains are, uh, can vary enormously from global complex supply chains through to small, very localized supply chains. But nevertheless, it, it is relevant to all of you to some degree. And like I've just said, the key feature um, in the context of what we're going to talk about today is the requirement under Section 54 for organisations that meet certain criteria to file um, annual transparency statements. Okay. Just in terms of the other objectives of the Act, it consolidated and simplified um, a lot of the existing um, offences around modern slavery and human trafficking. It created a, a few new civil orders. Um, it created the role of the anti-slavery commissioner. And like I've said, crucially requires annual reporting. And this is what I'm going to refer to as the Section 54 reporting requirement. So um, the, the key question is, what is the scope of Section 54? Who does it apply to? So it applies to commercial organisations that have an annual turnover of 36 million or above. It requires those organisations to complete an annual report, issue an annual statement, um, which, which talks about its, annual, uh, its modern slavery risks and the steps it's taking to mitigate those. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking around that in a moment. The other important point is that there is a requirement that the link to that statement is included on your website. And government guidance is that what you shouldn't do is take one statement down and replace it with the next year's statement. What the government is asking to see is sort of accumulation of statements over the years. The idea being that anybody can go in, look at the statements and the historical statements and see whether the business has made progress or whether the business is simply changing the date each year and issuing, reissuing the same statement. But let's turn to the turnover requirements and commercial organisations. So Kate, that would be the next slide, please. So um, the first point is that commercial organisations, when the, the legislation first came in, there was the, the slight misconception that the legislation applied to businesses and therefore um, probably excluded public bodies and third sector bodies such as charities. Um, the government guidance is that that is not the case. It applies to all organisations that are supplying goods or services. And the reality is that uh, a lot of public sector organisations and a lot of charitable organisations in the course of their activities are supplying goods and services. Um, so that's the first point to, to, to explain. Um, it applies to organisations, so corporates and partnerships, wherever they're incorporated, if part of their business is carried on in the UK. It applies regardless of whether you are in a trade, as it were, or a profession. And so, for example, Mills and Reed is captured by the requirement to, to file an annual statement. A key point here is the turnover requirement. So the, the legislation says that the, the legal obligation under the Act to file a Section 54 statement trips in when your turnover achieves, it reaches 36 million or over in a year. Um, the question here is, well, what counts as turnover? And there are some quite, there's some quite complex guidance on this because you potentially have to take into account group turnover outside of the UK. You potentially have to take into account turnover from non-UK uh, sales. And I say potentially here because the rules are, um, and the guidance is a little bit complex because it depends on the extent to which the non-UK elements of your business, so for example, if you're the subsidiary of an overseas parent, the extent to which your activities are under the control of the, the parent or the parent is part of your supply chain. So it isn't necessarily a straightforward answer of all um, global turnover needs to be taken into account. But I think that the, 
the point I would make here is don't assume that because the UK subsidiaries turnover is below 36 million, that you automatically disregard turnover elsewhere. So, so you, you need to sort of look at that. Um, of course, many of you will, may be sitting thinking, well, I don't need to worry about this because my turnover is under 36 million. I think there's a few points here. And point number one is, you know, don't forget the turnover threshold because you might be under 36 million this year, but in a couple of years time, you might not be. Um, the second point, though, is the government guidance is that even if you don't reach the 36 million turnover, it is good practice to prepare a statement and follow the processes that you need to prepare a good statement. But I think most importantly and, and, and of relevance is that what we are finding is that lots of businesses who, whose turnover is below 36 million are still being required by virtue of, of their supply chain to follow all the processes that you would need to file a statement. So to have in place due diligence processes. Um, that could be the, a criteria for being able to pursue a tender opportunity, for example. And if you're supplying to a large retailer, if you don't have those systems and processes in place, it can be something that would debar you from participating in their supply chain. So like I say, what we're actually finding is that lots of businesses with turnover below 36 million are ending up going down the route of having of, of filing a statement and putting the processes in place um, for, for a statement. So what does your section 54 statement um, need to say? Now, I think I've, to be fair, I got ahead of myself and have, have gone beyond this slide. Kate, okay, could I have the next one? So what your section 54 statement needs to set out is um, and this is set out in section 54 4 of the act but it is also set out in quite comprehensive guidance that the government issued around the act uh, probably about a year after the act came into force so you need to give information about your organization's structure what it does and give uh, an overview of its supply chain. So, for example, that might be we primarily source um, component parts from Bangladesh, India, wherever it might be. So some sense of, of the supply chains. It should talk about your assessment of risk and in particular, whether you consider that any elements of your supply chain are particularly at risk of modern slavery or, or human trafficking. Um, if you've not made any assessment on, on risk, your statement needs to say that. Of course, in order to be able to give an honest view of risk, you need to have carried out some due diligence. So you need to have a good understanding of your supply chain. So the guidance is that your statement should also outline the due diligence processes that your business employs on its supply chain to assess its risk and of course it may be that you carry out enhanced due diligence for suppliers certain suppliers or suppliers based in a certain part of the world um, it should talk about any relevant policies and other measures you have in place to seek to guard against modern slavery and human trafficking um, so that that could be, for example, a modern slavery policy, or, or some people prefer um, to call them ethical labour policies. And it could crucially include the contractual assurances that you seek from your suppliers um, when you're contracting with them. It should talk about um, the effectiveness of the measures you, you put in place. So how will you judge whether the processes that you have in place are robust enough to help you guard against modern slavery and traffic labour in your supply chain. So I suppose in another way it's, it's almost like a KPI and certainly that's something that uh, in my experience of working with businesses they, they tend to find that quite a hard um, sort of criteria to, to work out what they should be saying on that. 
importantly um, the guidance is also that you should outline any staff training that you make available on on modern slavery and, and human trafficking and interestingly here we get asked by lots of clients to well there are lots of online modules available are those sufficient and I think my answer to that is a little bit well it all depends so certainly for for some staff online modules would be perfectly satisfactory but you may identify that there are uh, certain functions that ought to have more enhanced training so one example is in the construction sector we may find that there are there are certain staff who are always on site and those staff Will be, will be the eyes and ears of the organisation in determining whether any subcontractors are bringing um, traffic labour onto site, for example. Another example might be your purchasing team, who are the people who are assessing suppliers. Um, so I think it's a matter of judging the risk profile of your business and whether there are people who are more frontline and likely to come across this issue as to whether you need to put in place an enhanced training. Um, importantly, the statement should be signed off by a board director or equivalent. And the idea behind that is because the government wants to see that this is an agenda item that is on the board's agenda and that the, the board is bought into it. So we're also often asked that the so what question, what if we don't do this? now? In all honesty, the actual sanctions for not filing a statement are pretty lame. In essence, the, the Secretary of State can, can go and get an injunction to force you to file a statement. Um, and there haven't really been many cases of those at all. I mean, interestingly, the Home Office is starting to write to businesses. They're, they're, they're monitoring who is filing their statements and they are sending reminders if people haven't filed their statements. But by far the most significant risk here is reputational damage. Um, I have Google Modern Slavery Alerts set up and th th there isn't, you know, a week goes by when I'm not getting an alert of a business that's been highlighted in the media um, as, as having modern slavery or traffic labour in its supply chain. Uh, so that is the, the significant risk and the risk that businesses are taking seriously along with the risk of not being able to participate in tenders or being debarred or delisted by their by their customer i mean i, I don't know if anybody spotted this morning on the bbc news there was um a, a, an article piece around um the garment manuf garment manufacturers in india who were supplying to the like likes of two and Marks and Spencers and, and, and several other high street retailers um, where it's been uncovered that the workforce is being kept in high, highly exploitative conditions um, and no doubt you know there will be a number of people who consumers who read that and and think twice about where they're buying their their clothes from again so like I say the most important that the big risk here is reputational damage. There are consumer interest groups and public interest groups um, who make it their business to look at people's supply chains, who make it their business to tip off um, journalists and so on. In terms, therefore, of what you should be doing, I thought it, might, it would be helpful to give you some food for thought. And I think it is fair to say that a sensible approach is a risk-based approach, which involves not only looking at your business, but looking at your supply chains and assessing the extent to which there are potential real risks around your supply chain. Um, it is fair to say that there are certain sectors that are acknowledged to be high-risk sectors. Um, these include food and agriculture, um, construction, retail supply chains, some advanced manufacturing supply chains. Um, if you think about it, anything where there is likely to be a high level of low paid migrant labour 
tends to be the areas that are at risk. In the context of the sort of world map of risk, um, there is a, the Global Slavery Index. Um, you can find that at the, the website is, this is all one word, globalslaveryindex.org. And that um, breaks down global risks or jurisdictional risks, as it were, by country and by particular sectors. So that is quite a useful point of reference. It operates quite sim in a quite similar way to the Transparency International um, Index for Corruption, so that, that type of thing. The other point to be thinking about is to be getting your purchasing team to be mapping their supply chain so that they have a, a good understanding of where they're getting product from and therefore and mapping that onto the index to understand high risk areas understand the labor force involved in that supply chain because that will give them a sense of 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 risk and then they can focus their activities and their due diligence and enhanced due diligence that they might want to do on the high risk areas I think another point here is ensuring that the purchasing team have clear purchasing policies and procedures and that could well involve due diligence questionnaires it could involve requiring suppliers to to give annual certifications on compliance equally having contractual protections in your purchasing contracts is an important tool in your in your toolkit of protections one of the questions that i am often asked is well we have a compliance with law obligation isn't that sufficient what i would say is that a compliance with law obligation itself is probably not sufficient and the reason i say that is that actually you you don't just want somebody to comply with the law but you want them to give you information and assurances and annual certifications and to notify you if they do uncover anything that that would amount to a, a sort of modern slavery and, and, and or trafficked labor um, so, so a compliance with law obligation in and of itself probably doesn't go far enough equally um, in high-risk sectors you would want the ability very quickly to do site inspections and conduct audits so that is something else you would want to build into your not just your policies and procedures but your contractual protections and I think the other key point is consistent messaging throughout the supply chain in the context of the fact that you have a zero tolerance approach to modern slavery uh, and, and human trafficking and I think that is an important thing to embed throughout your purchasing function and your communications with your supplier base. I mentioned training to employees. Um, equally, you may wish to think about if you are operating in a high risk sector, whether you should be rolling out some training to your suppliers. Or if you're using agents to, uh, if you like, police um, your, your overseas suppliers, ensuring that those agents are on board and are not turning a blind eye um, so I, I think overall a review and update of your existing policies um, if you haven't done it already could be a worthwhile exercise to ensure that you are doing the best you can in the context of ethical labor practices okay could i have the next slide please um, prior to moving on, I ought to just mention, I, I said I would, the coronavirus guidance that the government issued. They issued this um, at the end of April. And the, the reason for this was that there was an acknowledgement that the risk of human uh, trafficked labour and modern slavery could well increase as a result of the pandemic. Um, the view was taken that fluctuations in demand or a cohort of employees having to self-isolate and therefore labour needing to be recruited in a different way could result in increased risks. 
So what the government has, has said is we would like people's statement this year to acknowledge whether there are any particular coronavirus risks that they have considered and the steps they have taken to mitigate those risks. And examples of that might be additional health and safety that you have put in place in your business or you have required your suppliers to put in place um, to, to help safeguard workers against transmission of the virus. Um, steps you might have taken to support suppliers. So for example, I've come across businesses who have um, provided PPE to their suppliers to support local workers in protecting themselves. Whether you've engaged additional rigor around your recruitment processes, and this is probably particularly relevant if you're using employment agencies to bring in labor very quickly. And also an acknowledgement of any other coronavirus related risks. So that is, that is something that you should think about when preparing statements this year. Um, equally, the government acknowledges that in last year's statement, you may have talked about um, the steps you were going to take this year, absent of the pandemic. And they do recognise that that means you may well not have progressed those particular steps. And the government are saying, that's OK, we recognise that plans may have been disrupted um, and that you may have had to pivot your plans to identify and deal with um, specific coronavirus related risks. So just tell us about that, please. So, so that's the guidance um, that the government's issued, which, which, to be fair, I think most businesses are finding quite helpful. So I now want to move on to broader ethical issues. I'm sorry, Kate, could you go back to the previous slide? Thank you. Um, the other thing we're finding uh, is that businesses are, are paying more attention to wider human rights impacts. Um, and a lot of businesses are, are wanting to demonstrate that they are doing the right thing and they have the right processes in place for um, protecting human rights in, in, in its broader sense. The, the sort of gold standard, as it were, for, for that um, are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, they, that, like I say, they're the global standards. Under those guiding principles, the, the idea is that businesses are expected to have a good understanding and knowledge of the impact of their operations and their business relationships on human rights. Of course, to do that, you, you need to do some due, what you might call due diligence, but which in this context is often referred to as a human rights impact assessment. So if your organization starts talking about human rights, one of the first things to think about would be the UN guiding principles and conducting a human rights impact assessment. Now, the reality is I think that can sound really quite daunting. However, I think your first point of reference and something that should give you some comfort is that I would expect most of your organizations will have in place a number of tools already that can contribute to this assessment. So for example, you might have already your modern slavery policy or ethical labor policy you may well have non-discrimination policies you may well have health and safety policies you may well have site inspection and audit right regimes so you can look at the existing processes and policies and assessments you carry out and then you can look to see okay and, and where are the gaps and focus on those there's a piece here around um, considering it on a, on a local basis, on a business function basis, and of course on a site, so a jurisdictional basis. But I would hope that some of the tools you, your business already employs can be utilized um, if, you're, if you decide that you want to go down the route of, of, of wider human rights commitments. So I'd just like to round up now by talking um, 
around the role of the in-house team in, in all of this. Thanks, Kate. Um, I, I think it is fair to say that without much doubt, if your business was highlighted, if, if some sort of um, human rights breaches or modern slavery or, or unethical practices were to come to light, one of the first ports of call of your business would be to the in-house legal function. Um, and you would be drawn in to try and fight that fire and mitigate the impact. Now, it, it is fair to say that it is possible to turn a negative into a positive, and we've seen a number of examples of that. So, for example, a, few, a couple of years ago, Nestle was uncovered with um, some sort of quite unpleasant labour exploitation in some of its overseas suppliers. And the way Nestle responded to that received a lot of praise from um, human rights groups because they pivoted very quickly to addressing it and unveiling an action plan. That said, I think we would all prefer not to be in the position of having to pivot around that quickly, but to have good and robust practices um, in place to protect your organisation's reputation in the first place. So... If we think about this in the context of uh, risk management and in the context of reputational enhancement, um, you can see that there is also increased consumer scrutiny on the behaviour of businesses. We all know that consumers are, 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 are quite happy to switch allegiances very, very quickly if they think that business behavior is not what they expect and of course you know social media moves moves that discussion on and heightens the risk here um, significantly but the other point is it's even if you're not a consumer facing business uh, poor practice can come up to bite your business uh, because you could end up being barred from tenders from being delisted um, uh, and so on we only, we only have to think back a couple of months to the, the Boohoo scandal where, uh, and if you remember, that was the Sunday Times investigation that revealed very, very poor labour practices in the factories in Leicester, uh, whereby, um, you know, some workers were paid less than £3.50 an hour. Um, there was no health and safety or, <coughs> excuse me, social distancing or other protective measures to, to protect the workers from um, coronavirus. Um, the impact of that was a 35% drop in share value in one day and Boohoo being delisted by a number of, of retailers. Um, but the other point is it's not just consumers. So investors, so investment management companies are paying a lot more attention to this. We've worked with a number of businesses who have received investor inquiry letters wanting to understand more about the business's behavior um, and, and ethical practices and the policies and procedures that it has in place so investors are taking a greater interest in light of all that my own view is that the in-house legal function has a really important role to play um, it tends to have oversight across the business. It tends to be connected with a range of business functions. And it tends to have what I call historical visibility and uh, future visibility. Historical visibility in the context of quite often it's a little bit of the corporate memory of the organisation. It, it will know why something was done, uh, with the, the decision making process and so on for it. Um, and it will also understand something of the business's future plans. It might know whether new sites are planned, whether new suppliers are being onboarded, and crucially have a sense of the processes the business follows to do that. So from my perspective, this is an opportunity for an in-house function, not just to protect its organisation's reputation, and mitigate risk for it, 
but actually also to recognize and promote ethical be business behaviors and, it, and in that context support the business in adding value so that wraps up um, the, the sort of formal session uh, uh, of my presentation as it were um, I wanted to rerun if, if you don't mind and humor me the um, the poll that I ran we ran earlier just to see if people's views have changed um, it, it, in the last 30 minutes and I am pleased to see that I'm at least a little bit persuasive. Uh, we had good results on the, the agree and strongly agree earlier. Um, we have some people who strongly disagree, so, so it, it would probably be interesting uh, for a separate discussion to, to, to understand that, and that might be a function of, of the organisations or, or the role of, of the in-house team or the nature of the business, of course. Um, but, but, but to my mind, it is positive that we have 50% of, of, of you um, thinking that you have a, 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 an important role to play in, in reputation and, and ethical um, practices for your business. So if we could, we'll close that down now. Thank you, Kate. And I think now um, a couple of points. The first is uh, feedback, please. This is a, a, another plea for um, feedback and suggestions for future topics that you would like to hear about in December I believe it's the 3rd of December we are going to uh, I say this with a slightly uh, some trepidation at the moment and um, we're going to do a session um, giving a, a bite-sized roundup on where we are with Brexit looking at a range of, of topics such as supply chain and immigration and data protection um, so that's the 3rd of December slot but of course we're now in the process of planning what we would like to talk about next year so really really keen to hear from you as well with suggestions for for topics for next year so I will now take a look at some of the questions um, now changes to the uh, slavery act is the first question um, and I think it's fair to say, I um, uh, should have commented on this earlier, yes, the government has been talking about changes to the, to the Modern Slavery Act, principally around recognising that it is a fairly toothless piece of legislation in the context of sanctions. And so there's been a lot of discussion for a while as to um, changing the legislation so that the sanctions on business for not complying um, are, are greater. The reality is, is that those changes have been sidetracked somewhat this year in the context, of course, of the pandemic and, and Brexit. But the, the, when the government gets around to it, what we're expecting to see is a, a tighter and more enhanced enforcement regime. Okay. We have another question here. If you have a, U a UK HQ with a group turner over, of over 36 million uh, and a UK subsidiary turnover itself of 36, um, 36 million, do you publish one consolidated statement or two statements and would they be different? Right, that is an excellent question. Um, the, the answer here depends on the extent to which the various companies, so the HQ and the subsidiary, um, have different policies and processes in place. The extent to which they, I suppose, operate as very distinct businesses with distinct supply chains and therefore different risks, or whether what you, uh, the, the, the processes you have at HQ are actually trickle down to the subsidiary and the risk assessment is the same so you can uh, what you would do is you could publish a consolidated statement it would need to appear if you've got different websites on those different websites um, but there's no reason why you can't publish a consolidated statement provided it's, it's accessible in the right places and provided it's an uh, an accurate reflection 
of risk across those businesses and the policies and procedures that you um, that you follow. Um, for example, they could be different because they could have quite different supply chains. Um, so sometimes we, you know, we we will have a sort of group of companies where the actual individual subsidiary businesses are really quite different and their supply chains are different and the markets they service are different. So you sort of need to, to, to look at the practicalities and the reality of it and then make your decision as to how you deal with your statement. Uh, right, here's a question. Does the statement in your annual accounts have to be identical to the statement published on your website? Um, that's an interesting question. Our annual accounts have a much broader section on ethics and business practices. Uh, there is no, they don't have to be identical provided they follow the, what you need to cover in the guidance. So, so, so those points that I outlined, the section 54 um, requirements as to, as to what your modern slavery report covers. So that's the important piece. They don't have to be identical, but they need to cover the, the things that the government would like you to cover. Uh, now, in, in interestingly, this is uh, the, the next question um, is, is somebody um, who is, is picking up on this point about commercial organisations. And, and you are quite right uh, in terms of the fact that commercial organisation doesn't immediately sound like, uh, for example, a charity or a public sector body. However, um, and indeed, when the Act was first introduced, a number of public bodies sort of decided this doesn't apply to us. However, the government guidance has been clear. So the government guidance, I will um, tell you a little bit more around where you can find the government guidance shortly. But the government guidance does make clear that it is not exclusive to businesses that are operating for profit. So you don't have to operate for profit to be a commercial organisation for the purpose of the Act. Um, you, you merely have to supply goods or services. So, for example, uh, when the Act was first introduced, there, there were a lot of sort of NHS-related bodies who, who sort of thought, well, well, maybe this doesn't apply to us. But in the context of the way the Act is framed, there is the supply of goods and services uh, and therefore it applies and actually now if you look at a lot of public sector bodies um, websites and, and actually their tender requests as well they're very keen on understanding who their uh, the modern slavery policies and processes of their supplier organizations so that in a in a sense is my my short answer to that um, and then we've got where what rules guidance do I need to check for the 36 million turnover and that again is in the um, the government transparency guidelines I've got an enormous pile of things on my floor I'll bend down and pick them up so I can tell you the exact title of the guidance you need to look at um, for turnover that will also be relevant to, to the person who's asked about commercial organisations. Just another point uh, that should the statement take the format of section 54.5. Um, there isn't, the, the truth is there isn't really a prescribed format as such, so long as the statement covers the, the elements that I outlined earlier. So there isn't a, a fill box one in fill box two in fill box three in type of format it really is these are the things that your statement needs to cover um use um what are some useful points to hitting contractual measures with high-risk suppliers situations to combat modern slavery so um you would be obliging the supplier not to use modern slavery exploited labor um, in their organisation and to ensure that they pass that obligation down to their suppliers because of course you may have sub-tier suppliers below them that's that's one point you may require
require your supplier to ensure um, that that, that all local labour laws are complied with. However, there's there's a little bit of a nuance to that because, um, of course, some jurisdictions where you might be buying from may not have a, any protective local labour laws. So in, in particularly, particular high-risk areas, you may even be um, talking about ensuring that there's a right to education and, and so on. Um, you would want to be talking about health and safety of the workforce you would want to be ensuring that the workforce um it gives their labor freely um you would want to be requiring your supplier to notify you immediately if they have any um modern slavery concerns or investigations or have equivalent concerns down the supply chain you would want the ability to, for you, your authorised representatives, to conduct um, site inspections. Um, you would want audit rights. So you'd want to potentially be able to interrogate their books and records, including their employment records. Um, so so it, it goes on what um, one of the things we have found is that because these clauses in the actual contracts can end up being quite long, actually referring out and obliging your supplier to also comply with your modern slavery policy or your ethical labor policy and attaching that as a schedule to to the contract can be quite helpful because your modern slavery policy can go into a lot more detail otherwise you can end up with three pages of modern slavery clauses and some people don't like that so so it, it depends on the sort of contracting style and so on but i hope that that's given um, um, you a bit of guidance there is a statement shown on a foreign parent company's website and signed by parent board member okay to meet the uk requirement i think the question here um, it, it is actually the extent to which that website is easily accessible from the uk and is clear that it relates to uk activities because the point here is um, really around accessibility so ensuring that that statement is accessible if you don't have a uk website then th then there's sort of nowhere to post it but if there's a uk website it it would seem sensible to duplicate the foreign parent company's um statement as it were on your your uk site um and i think then signed by parent company board member I would the requirement actually is for it to be a UK board member so I think that depends on the sort of structure of the way um, because this relates to sort of UK activity as it or UK turnover wherever um, it, it, it's derived is, is one of the tests um, so I think I probably need to know a bit more about that and what's, what's driving that question in order to be able to give you uh, more detailed answers. Right, and then a final question, I'm a little bit conscious of time, is there any mechanism of reliance on the supplies of modern slavery statement for the business? Um, so I, I think here what you need to think about is the nature of the supplier. So you're, you're giving the example of office supply and paper from a UK trader. You would probably like to think that that is relatively low risk, but I suppose we could also say, well, what we don't know is what's happening in the, the paper uh, producing factory elsewhere. Um, th this comes down to the risk-based approach in all honesty. So I think really what you need to think about here is how much are we buying how critical is this to our business and is this a high risk sector you think not just on your own sector but the sector your supplier is operating in and you make it's a judgment it is the answer to this it's completely impractical for me to tell you that every single per business that that supplies to you needs to be investigated to the the eighth degree you know, what, what should Mills and Reed do? Investigate all the suppliers of its paper clip, of its paper clips, for example. So, so that that is the the um, 
the risk-based approach. Now, just prior to, to wrapping up, let me see. In my modern slavery pile, I should have, uh, hopefully, the government guidance um, paper somewhere. And I can tell you the exact... Um, hopefully the exact point of reference right okay the the document that you you should google to look for is on the government website and it's called um transparency and supply chains a practical guide so if you go to gov.uk you will be able to find that and it's got various annexes which give you examples around uh calculating turnover and so on so um for those of you um, with questions where, where we need to, to look more detail at the de in more detail at the guidance, have a look at that. Um, I'm hoping I have covered, I think I've covered everybody's questions. Um, the slides will be circulated afterwards, um, as will a link to the recording. So it just uh, remains for me to, again, ask for um, feedback um and and any topics you'd like to hear from us in the future and to thank you uh for for listening to me i've managed to talk for probably a little bit longer than i expected so hope you all have a great day thanks for for joining bye bye <laughs>